Hello, and welcome to the 2020-2021 Better Buildings webinar series. In this series, we are profiling the best practices of Better Buildings Challenge and Alliance partners and other organizations working to improve energy efficiency in buildings. Next slide. My name is Adam Guzzo. I'll be your moderator for today. Um, you can go to the next slide. I've been uh, with the Department of Energy since 2010, advising state and local governments on strategies uh, to maximize energy and cost savings through energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies, programs, and policies. Uh, more specifically, I provide technical assistance on energy data management and serve as the project lead for the state and local planning for energy or slow platform, which is the topic of today's webinar. Next slide. So here are the items we're gonna cover during today's webinar. Uh, I'll introduce you to the state and local planning for energy or slope platform, uh, which I'll refer to as slope uh, from here on out. Matt Downeth from the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, will provide some background on Milwaukee's goals and energy planning needs. Next, we'll hear from Megan Day from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and she'll give a slope demonstration. And Matt and Megan will show you how slope can be applied specifically in the context of Milwaukee to address some of the questions that they raised in their energy and climate planning processes. And then finally, we'll take your questions and what I have what I hope will be a, a beneficial discussion. Next slide. So before we dive into the content, let me explain a little bit about how we're gonna handle Q&A. Uh, we'll be using an interactive platform called Slido uh, for both our Q&A and to gather some feedback from you via polls. Um, so we're actually gonna launch a poll here in just a minute. So if you could, please go to slido.com uh, either using your mobile device or opening uh, by opening a new window in your internet browser. And then you'll enter today's event code, which is DOE. And if you'd like to ask our panelists any questions, we encourage you to submit them anytime throughout the presentation into Slido. Uh, we'll be answering your questions near the end of the session. You can select the thumbs up icon for questions that you like. It's a cool feature in Slido. And that'll result in the most popular questions moving to the top of the queue and that's generally where we'll start. Next slide. So we're going to start things off with a poll so we can learn more about your familiarity with slope. So again please join us over at Slido to respond to these polls and you should see one up on your screen now. Yep it says how familiar are you with slope? So thanks for taking a minute to give us some feedback. Uh, that'll help us see how much more work we need to do uh, to continue to promote slope and venues like this one. Yeah, so for those of you that are learning about slope for the first time, and it appears that as many of you, um, you're in the right place. Uh, and hopefully after this webinar, you'll better understand what it is uh, and how it can help you uh, meet your energy and climate goals. So again, thanks for the feedback. Uh, hopefully you're getting kind of familiar with how this is gonna work. We're gonna do a couple of these polls uh, throughout our webinar today. So we'll give you another couple of seconds to wrap that up. Great. All right, we can go ahead and close that poll and move to the next slide. Okay, so again, the focus of today's presentation is slope. Um, for those, and there were many of you that are not familiar with slope, slope integrates and delivers data on energy efficiency, renewable energy, and coming very soon, sustainable transportation into an easy to access online platform to enable, enable excuse me, data-driven state and local energy planning. Uh, SLOPE is a collaboration between nine U.S. Department of Energy offices and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, and is designed to support state and local governments and other key energy planning stakeholders in building a 100% clean energy economy. So SLOPE can assist decision makers in understanding the various cost-effective options to meet their clean energy and climate goals. Uh, it captures the value of the numerous but dispersed energy data and tools available by increasing awareness of and access to these resources. And then we hope it provides an integrated and, and easy to use platform with compelling data visuals, uh, to visualizations for users to explore and, and better understand the impacts of energy actions. So one of those data visualizations uh, is the map presented here on this slide. Uh, what you're seeing is the technical generation potential for distributed wind mapped by county across the United States. And before we get into a live demonstration of slope, I wanna give you a flavor of the types of questions slope can answer, how state and local governments are using slope and the data available in slope. So you can go to the next slide for that. 
So what are the types of questions Slope can answer? Well, what's outlined on this slide are just a representative sample of questions that Slope can help address. So for example, if you're interested in designing targeted programs to reduce energy consumption or energy related costs in the residential, commercial and or industrial sectors, Slope provides the projected electricity consumption and expenditures for those sectors under a business as usual case out to year 2050. And that data is available at the state, county and city level. Or perhaps you're interested in encouraging greater investment and development of solar in your jurisdiction. So Slope provides the technical generation potential of residential and commercial rooftop PV by state and county. So you can see how your state or your county compares to jurisdictions um, surrounding you know, states or counties. And then we also have similar data for other renewable technologies such as bioenergy, geothermal, wind, and hydropower. And then as I mentioned earlier, we're really excited to soon be adding transportation data to Slope. Uh, and that will help answer questions like, what could future electricity and fuel consumption and vehicle miles traveled look like under different transportation scenarios? Next slide. So how are state and local governments using Slope? Uh, you're gonna hear from Milwaukee, Wisconsin in a few minutes about how they're using Slope to support their energy planning. But here are a few other representative examples from states and a city in a different uh, region of the United States. Uh, you can see in the case of New Mexico, they're using Slope to help guide planning uh, of, of its or their grid modernization roadmap project. Maine is using Slope's levelized cost of energy data to augment some professional energy modeling that they've contracted. And the city of Miami, Florida is using Slope to inform building efficiency ordinances, renewable energy pilot programs, community outreach and education, and future generation planning in collaboration with uh, its utility. Next slide. So, we're going to look at, here's a whole picture uh, of all the data available on Slope. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to walk through all the items on this slide. Instead, I'll just highlight a few. I already talked about the energy consumption and transportation data. We also have data on energy efficiency, including the electricity and fuel savings potential from cost-effective single-family home energy improvements. And that data is available at the state level. I also noted that Slope has data on energy generation. And you can see the list of technologies provided here more specifically. Uh, and some of that data is modeled down to the county level. In addition to the technology specific data, Slope has projected electricity generation through 2050 under 12 different scenarios, such as low and high demand growth scenarios, and that data is available at the state level. And then Slope also has projected electricity costs for 16 generation technologies plus battery storage through 2050, and that data is available at the state and county level. So those are just some, some highlights of what's on this slide. Beyond what's currently available on Slope, we're considering developing additional functionality and adding new data this year. So for example, we're looking to add scenario planning functionality that would provide users with sector-wide energy emissions and system cost impacts from various supply and demand side scenarios. We're also looking into how we could incorporate data on environmental justice or energy equity to allow our users to target programs and policies to energy communities. So hopefully that gives you a high level flavor for Slope to whet your appetite, so to speak, and go to the next slide. In a bit, Megan Day from NREL is going to walk you through a live demonstration. She'll serve you that full course meal to continue the analogy, so you can see the full capabilities and functionality of Slope. Uh, but now it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Donath from the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and go to the next slide. Matt coordinates the city of Milwaukee's energy reduction team, uh, which is tasked with reducing energy use and emissions from city buildings, fleet, and operations. And Matt also manages the city's other efficiency programs and initiatives, including the Better Buildings Challenge for Commercial Buildings, the ME2 Residential Energy Efficiency Financing Program, the City of Milwaukee's PACE Program, and the city's interdepartmental EV readiness team. So Matt's going to provide a bit of context on Milwaukee, its energy and climate goals, and some of the questions the city has looked at and how to achieve those goals. With that, I'll hand it off to Matt. You can go to the next slide. Thanks, Adam. So just want to provide a little bit of background on the city of Milwaukee. Um, I think it helps provide some context for our goals and some of the strategies we'll discuss later on. So Milwaukee is Wisconsin's largest city, and it's actually the fourth largest city in the Great Lakes region. Um, currently have a population just under 600,000, and it's been holding steady there for a while now. 
Um, we have a fairly diverse city. Our, our demographics for breakout is about 38% black, 35% white, 20% Hispanic, and 5% Asian. Um, and this is reflected a lot in our equity goals that we'll discuss later on. And similar to many other Midwestern manufacturing cities, we have a fairly old building stock. Um, the statistics are a little outdated, but um, currently about 70% of our single family and multifamily units were built before 1955. That percentage might have dropped a little bit more recently, but it's still a high number. And then our commercial and industrial building stock is similarly aged. A lot of our downtown buildings were early 1900s or even uh, pre-1900s. Um, our city hall, for example, was built in 1890, and a lot of our municipal buildings are, are up there in age. And then about 42% of housing units are owner occupied currently, which is slightly above the national average. And then uh, one other thing that, that tends to, to come up, especially when we discuss energy planning, is the generation fuel mix from our utility. Um, so currently we're still heavily dependent on fossil fuels with 37% from coal and 32% from natural gas and only 7% from renewables. So when we just start to discuss um, looking at greenhouse gas reduction, obviously, you know, this is a big part of it. And then also looking at adding DDRs to public buildings and, and with private businesses and residences. Next slide. So for a little bit more background on our office. Um, so the Environmental Sustainability Office was created in 2006. And we launched our first sustainability plan in 2013 called Refresh Milwaukee. Um, Refresh Milwaukee had eight primary issue areas that set 10-year goals that, were, that are set to end here in 2023. Those eight issue areas are our buildings, energy, food systems, human capital, land use, mobility, resource recovery, and water. Um, and I think most pertinent for today's discussion are our energy goals. So we do have a 25 by 25 goal, which was to have 25% of um, energy used by the municipality to be re from renewable resources by 2025. So obviously we just have a few years left to get there. And then the uh, Better Buildings Challenge. So we did join the Department of Energy's Better Buildings Challenge and committed to reducing energy use uh, across our building portfolio by 20%. And then we did take that a step farther and launch a program um, targeting commercial buildings in Milwaukee to also have them reduce their energy by 20%. Next slide. So since our first sustainability plan, um, we're going into another phase of planning. Um, Milwaukee's mayor and common council created a, the Joint City County Task Force on Climate Change and Economic Equity in 2019. In 2020, we spent the year doing a greenhouse gas inventory and doing our initial study. Um, and what that did was that set our goals um, for community-wide greenhouse gas reduction. So we currently have a goal of 45% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030, and then to be net zero by 2050 or sooner. Um, and as we go into 2021, we're going into the next phase of this climate planning process. And really what we're trying to answer here is how do we reach the greenhouse gas reduction goals with a focus on equity and local job creation. Next slide. So as we started trying to answer those goals, um, that's what led us to use the slide platform. Um, and this sample of questions here was an example of questions that led us to, to look into slope more closely and things that we've been able to use the platform for to answer some questions. Next slide. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that context. It's really helpful. We'll look forward to hearing from you more here shortly. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, you to Megan Day. So Megan works at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and leads research analysis and technical assistance on municipal energy planning and policy, utility scale photovoltaic development, and integrating solar in local land use and zoning codes. She manages the city's leading through energy analysis and planning project, which provides localized energy data and analysis for every U.S. city to enable more strategic energy decisions. She's also my counterpart leading the SLOPE project at INRA. Uh, so Megan's going to serve you up that four-course meal on SLOPE. Hope everybody's hungry. Um, and with that, Megan, take it away. Thank you, Adam, and thanks, Matt, for being here and, and walking through this. So quick introduction to SLOPE, and then we'll get some back and forth from um, Matt and We'll see how Slope was able to answer some of his questions and, and apply this data. So to start off with, if you've seen my screen okay here, this is the Slope platform. And uh, we have added a bunch of bells and whistles in response to user feedback over the last year, including a home and about page to kind of orient you to the platform. There's a lot of data here, so we wanted to help folks ease into that. A um, couple of features I want to point out, just uh, the home page here is pointing you to the new 
capability to have your own account, a user account, where you can save your settings and defaults. And there's also a new introductory video, so just give you a little orientation to the platform. On the About page, you'll find some frequently answered, uh, asked questions, as well as um, the citation and some uh, information on the, the data and the sources. So I want to point out here, I get this question a lot, um, how to create that account uh, with different email accounts. So that's the Home and About page. And let's go to the meat of this story here in the data viewer. Um, so the data viewer has 40 energy data sets here, right? On efficiency, renewables, and coming soon, sustainable transportation, as Adam mentioned. The layout of Slope is basically a description of the data set here with links to all the methodologies. And you can dig in as deep as you'd like to get all your questions answered on how we came up with this data, also some good resources that you can off-ramp to. And then you have an identification of what jurisdiction and you're looking at, a time slider for those data sets that have time series data, and you can download all of this data uh, with this button right here. The main visualizations, you'll generally see a map and a chart to help you explain what this data is with an interactive uh, data filter, right? It's a legend, but it's interactive. You can turn things on and off. Just want to point that out. All right. So, Matt, why don't you launch into your first question, and I'll pull up Milwaukee. All right. So the first question we had was, what sector should Milwaukee focus on that will have the biggest impact on reducing our emissions? Right. All right. So here we are in the data layer that is modeled electricity and natural gas consumption by sector, right? So we're looking at the Coral Quest map here for the county of Milwaukee. And you can zoom out and see your consumption in total MMBTUs for combined electricity and natural gas uh, across the country. So being a city, it's pretty high and we're down here in 2050. So if we look at maybe about 2020, we can see how that Coral Plus map might change, right, over time. So here on the right, we have our time series chart. Again, model data for electricity and natural gas consumption by sector. And so we can see here that the red of the commercial sector is, um, for fairly even, a little bit more consumption of natural gas. And the residential sector, orange and yellow here, well, natural gas is orange and yellow is here electricity. So we can see that Milwaukee is consuming a bit more uh, natural gas than electricity in terms of MMBTU. So what I think was instructive to find out for Milwaukee, which is common for many other communities, is if you change this to dollars spent, the opposite is true, quite so, right? So now we have far less dollars spent on natural gas than electricity in the commercial sector and in the residential sector. This yellow line here, uh, band, is the electricity expenditures. So we can see that if Milwaukee's looking to save money for their businesses and their residents, Electricity is a much more expensive proposition and could really lend itself to energy savings um, as well as cost savings in both the, the commercial and the residential sectors. Um, so I want to make sure we uh, look down to um, how this compares across the sectors here. So just looking at the data filters and the Coral Plus map here, again, higher because it's the city. So Matt, did you, were you able to use that data? Yeah, so we were able to use this in a couple different ways. So um, first, when we did our greenhouse gas inventory, um, we actually had some issues with the way um, industrial and commercial were separated. So we did get um, data directly from the utility, but, but they lumped in anything that had a um, demand charge as an industrial um, sector. So it was a little bit muddied and this was helped us kind of fill in that gap so we could see what we expected our commercial energy use to really be. 
Um, and then as Megan alluded to, if we're looking at saving electricity or saving costs for residents, um, focusing on electricity, electricity savings would be more beneficial, especially if we start talking about the equity impact and lowering energy burden um, on our residents. Great, thank you. So we can see here that a lot of expenditures are occurring in the commercial sector. So next we looked at what kinds of commercial buildings uh, are in Milwaukee. Um, so here we can look at the building area by square feet by building type. Um, so we can see that we split this out by the total area of each building. Um, so which buildings fall within each threshold, right? This is helpful if you're considering perhaps a building energy ordinance where you're asking commercial buildings to report their energy consumption um, based on generally those buildings over a certain square footage. So you can see how many buildings and what type are over 5,000 square feet versus 50,000. In Milwaukee, it doesn't drop that much. There's a lot of large buildings over 50,000 square feet. So uh, there's a lot that can be tackled here on the large building side. And we can see that of these buildings that are 50,000 square feet and higher, the largest sector is the multifamily sector in orange there. So again, there's a nexus here. If you want to be tackling reducing energy burdens and costs for your residential sector, multifamily large buildings could be potentially included in any kind of um, approach that you use for commercial buildings. So that's a way to understand your commercial building area as well as count um, for Milwaukee. Matt, were you able to use that data? Yeah, this was helpful for us um, in a couple of ways. So one, it was it was a little bit surprising to see that so much of our um, commercial building area was taken up by the, the largest buildings. We do have a pretty concentrated downtown area that, um, you know, we obviously have our largest buildings downtown. Um, but it also shows that there's still a pretty high count of small buildings, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 square feet and below. So for us, it was helpful to see that, um, knowing that the difference in needs for a program to meet the needs of a building that's 5,000, 50,000 square feet or above, or one that's 5,000 and below, um, we'd have to target those programs very differently. Um, so it was helpful just to see, you know, the scale and the spread between these two, um, knowing that we're going to have to tailor programs specifically to meet those needs, especially if we start discussing our Better, better Buildings Challenge program and, and our goal to reduce 20%, reduce energy by 20% in that sector. Great, thanks. All right, let's take a look at efficiency and see how we might save some energy in these sectors. So going back up here to energy efficiency, we've got two main data sets. One is the electricity savings potential by sector, and we're going to select the State of Wisconsin. This is a state level data set. And it's modeling out here electricity efficiency savings potential um, by sector. And so here we can see this is an EPRI study that the red commercial sector has the highest electricity savings potential with efficiency measures over time. The width of this band is the difference of a zero incentive to a $20 per megawatt hour incentive. So we can see that incentives are not making that much of a difference here in, in the commercial sector. They make more of a difference in the residential sector here in yellow. So you might wanna consider targeting your incentives in that way. Um, so good news for the uh, commercial electricity savings that we saw was a really big part of your electricity expenditures, right? Or your energy expenditures overall were high on the commercial electricity side. I also want to look at um, the other data set that we have as far as energy savings potential. And this is modeled single family home energy savings potential across the state of Wisconsin. Um, so here we've modeled all of the buildings that are single family home detached buildings in the state of Wisconsin and all the different configurations therein. And we've only measured those or included those measures that are cost effective with a current positive net present value. And so here we see that on the electricity side, in those single family homes, which even in large cities like Milwaukee tend to be the largest um, number by far of residential homes are these single family detached. So LED lighting is going to save you a lot of electricity in Wisconsin, as well as upgrading electric 
furnaces to variable speed heat pumps at wear out. So this is a high electricity savings potential as well as upgrading electric water heaters to heat pump water heaters. So even in these cold climates, we're finding that heat pumps are a really large energy savings measure. And then you can also look at fuel savings. And here we've got basement wall insulation, smart thermostats, drill and fill, wall sheathing, et cetera. So ways to kind of target those most effective uh, energy savings measures for your state. So um, next question, Matt. Yeah, so just going through this data was, was helpful. And whether, with it being at the state level, it wasn't as dialed into Milwaukee, um, but it was still helpful, especially on the electricity saving side. On the fuel saving side, we know that we have some issues with our building stock because um, it's so different than the rest of the state. We are an you know, older city. It's going to be different than the suburbs and some of the rural areas. Um, so that led us to looking um, for another source. We actually went to the, the lead tool to answer this question. Um, but we asked, as Milwaukee works to meet its energy and climate goals, how does the city ensure that the, the benefits of a clean energy economy are realized by energy burden communities and help mitigate racial and economic inequity? And how can we ensure that the how can the city ensure that energy costs are not raised for these burdened communities? Great, and so uh, the lead tool is a great way to differentiate that building stock, as well as tenure, renter versus owner occupied, and understand in your city and down to the census tract level, how that breaks down and where you might be able to target your programs or policies to extend those benefits to your most in need community. So here we're looking at the low income low income energy affordability data or lead tool, right? And again, we're looking at a, a map, Coral Plus map and a chart. Um, what I'm showing here is the energy burden, the percent of your annual income average for the census tract spent on energy. And so these are utility bills. So we can see here the darker blue is higher and over 6% is considered a high energy burden. Um, and if we zoom into Milwaukee here, we can see that there are definitely some communities um, within the city that are experiencing high energy burdens, right? So we can see 6%, 8% um, across some of these census tracts. So again, a way to target by neighborhood um, some of your programs and policies. And let's look just down at the bottom here where I've pulled up a map of your energy burden compared to the state. So this is city compared to state um, by tenure, renter versus owner occupied and area median income. And here we can see that the highest energy burdens are experienced by those who are living in owner occupied households um, in the lowest income um, group, which is the zero to 30% of area median income. And we can pull up a housing count and understand that in Milwaukee, we've got almost 10,000 households estimated um, spending a total of 19% of their annual income on average on their electricity and natural gas bills. So that's really high, might be a further way to target those benefits and incentives to those folks most in need. And obviously owner-occupied makes uh, that split incentive not an issue, so um, that tends to be across the country where you see the highest energy burdens is owner-occupied, lowest income quintile here. So that's the lead tool. Are you able to use that at all, Matt? Yes, yeah, so this was really helpful for us. Looking at the energy burden data by census track gave us a, a better feel for which neighborhoods we should be trying to target some of our programs. Um, so we currently do have our ME2 program, which is a residential energy efficiency financing program. So we've already started targeting specific neighborhoods with communications, working with community groups in those areas, trying to get the word out and, and reach homeowners. And then as we get into the next phase of our climate planning process, we're going to be using this data to you know, develop um, strategies that will that most impact these communities. Knowing that equity is such a large part of our plan, we just want to make sure that um, this is an address because it's obviously a, a major equity issue. Right. And for those of you in, in more um, tribal areas, you can map by either county lines here, or you can show tribal areas and see um, where that energy burden breaks down across tribal boundaries. Um, 
All right, so that gets us to the next major question for slope, Matt. Yeah, so the, <clears throat> excuse me, third question we had was how much of Milwaukee's energy consumption could be met by locally generated renewable energy? I mean, this was especially important for us um, looking at some of the goals we have. So obviously our 25 by 25 goal with a deadline you know, right around the corner here. And then also knowing that if we're going to reach 45% reduction by 2030 and 100% by 2050, that um, we'll obviously have to heavily invest in renewable energy. Right. So this is where we've got some new data that's available. Um, and we've modeled it down to the county level for many of these data sets wherever we could. Um, so here we're looking at the county of Milwaukee. And this is a coral plant plus map of the residential rooftop technical potential. And so all of these are, are modeled as technical potential, which is a combination of the resource potential, how much sun is shining in this area, plus the suitability of the, in this case, rooftop or the land in terms of utility PV. And so it's a combination of the, to give you a really a high bound for your planning purposes, right? You're never gonna really achieve this much potential because it means that every rooftop that's suitable for rooftop PV would be built for rooftop TV. Doesn't take into consideration things like the structure and its capability to hold that weight um, and who owns it, if it's renter occupied, et cetera. So this is, can really be seen as a very upper bound for your planning purposes. But we found that residential and roof, commercial rooftop PV potential, so this is a logarithmic map or chart here, so it doesn't quite look to scale, but um, combined residential and commercial rooftop PV potential, if you built all of that out that was the suitable rooftop, that only equals about a quarter of Milwaukee's combined electricity consumption. Right, so we then looked at, okay, what about utility PV? If you built out all of the suitable land area for larger scale PV in the county, how would that meet their needs? And again, it's only about a quarter of their electricity consumption currently as we model. And so that tells us one of two things, right? That you either need to look at additional renewable technologies if you're gonna try to get high penetration renewables, or you need to look outside of your county boundaries. So it turns out that with utility scale PV, that Milwaukee, obviously, we don't assume that you're gonna build a larger solar farm in an urbanized area. You're not gonna build out houses and, and buildings. Um, so Milwaukee has a lower utility PV potential than its surrounding counties. And so these surrounding counties, it turns out, could generate over twice as much electricity through utility scale PV as Milwaukee consumes in electricity. So something to look at, maybe looking outside your boundaries or other technologies. And I'll just pull up um, a couple here. So distributed wind, um, Adam showed us earlier, there's a lot of potential there. We'll look at the cost later and we'll see why there's not as much distributed wind, um, as well as land-based wind. There is some in the county of Milwaukee. And then there is also offshore wind potential in the Great Lakes. So that's another potential renewable source. Matt? Yeah, so this was uh, really helpful for us. I think definitely in, in kind of telling the story of how renewables will have to work in Milwaukee, I think there tends to be the thought process from a lot of community members that, you know, if we put solar on every rooftop that we're going to be 100% renewable. And this was a great way to show that and, and demonstrate it through the graphs and, and visualizations that was easier to understand. Um, so it's a great way for us to communicate that. And then I think looking at the utility scale side, it also shows that you know, we'll have to work with our utility to, to ensure that we meet our goals. Um, I did show the, the fuel generation mix earlier. So that um, you know, obviously was relatively low. Knowing that we have all this, this uh, potential generation around us, I think will lead to more conversations with our utility. Great. I'm going to show you a couple more renewable energy generation potential. So here we're modeling, um, because I want to show you this, it's higher in Milwaukee. You can see here this is geothermal heat pump economic potential. So this is ground source heat pump where you're drilling holes in the ground generally to um, have that heat exchange. So it's like an air source heat pump but you're using the underground um, temperatures. And so Milwaukee has a very high uh, economic potential as compared to other counties across the country as far as geothermal heat pumps. And also wanted to show you 
which was not such a good story for Milwaukee, um, we have hydropower potential for new stream reach development as well as non-powered dams. So these are dams that exist, could have hydropower generation added. Unfortunately, Milwaukee doesn't have any in their, their nearby vicinity that could work with maybe some other counties in the state. Um, and areas to take advantage of some of that low-cost hydro power potential. So, all right, your final question, Matt. Yeah, and the last question was, um, what renewable technologies are most cost-effective in Milwaukee over time? Great, so here we're gonna look at the levelized cost of energy, and we'll take a look at by county, although state is just fine too. Um, so for the county of Milwaukee, it's going to take us a little while to pull this up here. Um, we mapped out, based on the Regional Energy Deployment System model, or REED, the estimated cost um, over time, right? And so here we can see, um, through 2050, some of the lowest cost technology in the county is land-based wind. Um, if you take advantage of that little bit of generation potential. Currently, it's probably gas. That's why we're seeing purple here. We're modeling in the map the lowest cost generation technology, um, and this is in 2020. So hydro is this lighter blue, darker purple in, in Milwaukee because we saw there wasn't hydro potential is natural gas. But if we look at this out in 2050, by then, land-based wind is going to be one of the lowest cost technologies in much of the Midwest. And hydro remains a low-cost technology, and this is generally smaller hydro. We're not talking about major new impoundments and dams and reservoirs. Um, so we can see land-based wind across much of the country. And just quickly, I'm going to show you the last graph here. This is the levelized cost of saved energy, the program administration cost of using energy efficiency for saving energy. So here's a way to kind of compare generating new energy versus the cost of saving energy. And uh, we can see here that Wisconsin has the lowest cost of the 41 states modeled um, for program administration um, for energy efficiency. So it's something that you might definitely want to consider in, in Wisconsin and in Milwaukee. So Matt, how did you, you want to summarize this for us? Yeah, absolutely. So this data is all extremely useful for our long-term planning, knowing that we have to, um, you know, reach our, our goal of net zero by 2050. The program administration one was was a little surprising to us, but it makes sense because we know that our electricity costs are a little bit higher here. So if we can focus our efforts um, with partnering with the utility and, and doing energy efficiency programs, um, that gives us an opportunity to really um, make sure that the benefits are, are are seeing the benefits from these programs are being seen by. Um, everybody in our community, and uh, that, again, that leads into um, our focus on, on equity across our programs. All right, so then the, the last slide here was just, um, you know, how we envision using SLOPE and how we've used it so far. Um, so we've alluded to some of this in the, the presentation already, but the first way was to use the data to suggest planning prioritization for the Climate Equity Task Force. So as I mentioned, we're going through the planning process this year as we start looking at um, strategies and programs that we would like to, to roll out to meet those goals, we can use these uh, the data and visualizations to help um, prioritize which programs are going to have the greatest impact. Um, and the second way is to identify building sector type and size that would be most impactful as program priorities. So as we looked at um, building count and building area um, in Milwaukee, that was very helpful for us to kind of break out which sectors um, we would be able to target to have the most impact on energy reduction as we move forward. And then um, a third way that is, was, has been useful so far, and I think we'll use uh, more in the future, is using slopes, charts, and graphics as a communication tool. So as, as I mentioned earlier with the um, rooftop PV, it's very helpful to demonstrate the, the energy chain or the amount of energy generation and what we actually need to meet our goals. Um, and with different visualizations and data sets in the tool, um, there's opportunities to do this as well, to use it as a communication tool. And then lastly, um, we thought it was it was very helpful to compare the slope tool to a greenhouse gas inventory, um, partly to make sure that the data we had was was accurate in a greenhouse gas inventory. And then it also gave us a, a little bit of an opportunity to see um, from the, the projections out into 2030, 2040, and, and 2050. Um, so I think that was a great way for us to use the greenhouse gas inventory in conjunction with the slope tool. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you, Megan, both for walking through how to utilize Slope and um, letting us use you, uh, so to speak, in Milwaukee as a guinea pig to address some specific questions that you raised, and I imagine other jurisdictions likely have as they consider what kinds of policies and programs may be necessary to meet their energy and climate goals. So thank you both. Uh, um, so this, at this time, we're going to be taking uh, your questions. Uh, again, we're going to do that through Slido, and I already see there are quite a few in here. Um, so if you haven't had a chance yet to populate Slido or upvote questions that you want to uh, hear from us and us try to address, please do so. I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball. Um, I'm going to ask Matt and Megan one to come back on video, and we can work through these questions together. Yeah. Uh, while they do that, I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball and see, Megan, if you can pull um, your screen back up, because a few questions here, as you'll see, are around what are Slope's data sources, uh, how often is, is the data updated, you know, where we get some of the data that we're utilizing. Um, so I think it would be great if um, we could show you just where you can get that information directly uh, on Slope. Um, so Megan has, uh, Megan showed you earlier the about page, yep, and uh, we can point you directly to where you can see what, for example, where are the data sources. Um, so Megan, you wanna address these and I'll stop talking? Sure, so lots of data sources on Slope, and here is a rundown of some of them with links to many of the tools that we use to generate these data sources, um, and the jurisdictionally resolved data that you see mass and in charts on slope. So that's a good way to find some of the data, as well as, as I mentioned, the, the data description up here. So for each data source, data set, we have a link to methodologies, tools, publications, and then other kinds of tools that might be useful for you. So lots of ways to link to the data sources on slope. Uh, in general, we're pulling from a lot of the NREL tools and modeling, as well as um, um, EPRI, Electric Power Resource Research Institute, and um, other data sets. And Megan, how often is the data on slope updated? It's one of the questions of most interest here to folks. Sure, so it is updated uh, regularly, and it depends on the data set. So let's the regional energy deployment system is updated annually based on annual energy outlook from the Energy Information Administration. And so that will be updated. We've already done a revision of the cost of energy, right? Um, so this is the levelized cost of energy across the country. We're modeling that every year. That's updated every year, as well as the standard scenarios. Um, and this is projected generation by technology um, in different 12 different scenarios. So this is also updated every year. And uh, other data sources are updated as we have those studies renewed and that's kind of an as available. Great. And sticking with that theme, there was a specific question of, um, from one of our attendees about where Slope gets its data about consumption and potential retrofit for generation options. So can you talk about that while you're talking about data sources, Megan? Sure, so this data is built on a model that we ran that um, modeled the electricity and natural gas consumption across the country. We modeled it for every single U.S. city, but we did so in a way that looked at a bottom-up, top-down approach. So we took the Energy Information Administration's data by state, and we modeled energy consumption by census block um, for the residential sector at least, and based on the number of households and the type of households, and then we true them up. So we're, we're modeling um, for every city, county, and state what this electricity and natural gas consumption plus expenditures are. So it's a model, and then we projected it over time in a business as usual case based on annual energy outlook projections. Um, so that is a model. Um, it's not going to be, you know, reflecting minute changes that you're going to accomplish based on um, programmatic changes. So some people want historic data. The best source for that is generally looking at historic um, 
Energy Information Administration data or your own utility will have a lot of that good data. So let's do one more kind of modeling specific question and then audience get ready. We're gonna throw another poll at you here in a second. Um, so the next one on the list in terms of popularity, what is the modeling methodology behind energy use predictions at, at the county level? This is a multi, multi part question, but that's the first part. Okay, so we're looking at the same data set, I'm assuming, at the county level. I think that's a fair assumption. Um, I think that's what we're, we're getting at. So here I described how we did model it at the city, county, and state levels. Um, so we're looking at, let's grab a county here. Um, again, projected by sector, the Energy Administration Information Administration provides the 861 and 786, I believe, forms. And um, we modeled a different methodology for each sector. And you can link to that here and read all about it. It's uh, 41 pages of methodology <laughs> if you want to dig into that. Um, so we use different data sets for each sector to make sure we pull the, the most relevant and, and populated data sets available. So that's how we modeled that, and then uh, the baseline data, and then we used um, a projection methodology that's described here. Um, looks, again, basing it on annual energy information projections for a business as usual case. And that's the process there. Hope that answers the question. Let me know if there's more parts to that that I missed. No, you covered that. I think that then the other elements are asking about the, the building level analysis or the building portfolio analysis. So if you can talk a little bit about both the single family um, home data from Redstock and our CoStar data, um, which is where we pull our, our commercial buildings data. Uh, it's not clear to me from reading the question which one in particular this person is interested in. So let's just hit both of them. Yeah, so this is a, a great analysis that we did at NREL using. We basically had 350,000 different types, configurations of single family homes, depending on the siding, the roofing, the number of stories, the number of bedrooms, et cetera. Um, and we used supercomputing modeling to understand based on different energy efficiency interventions, um, what would be the most cost effective and energy saving potential measures. Um, so that's where we come up with these um, single family home energy savings measures that are all cost effective. And this is the statewide savings potential based on each measure. That data also has the individual household savings measure per, per year um, if you implemented these cost savings measures. Um, then let's look at the CoStar data. So that's based on res stock modeling and they use things like the RECS, Residential Energy Consumption Survey, um, as well as a wealth of different data sets to understand the building stock and its different configurations in each state. The building count and area is based on COSTAR, commercial real estate data. And so they collect data on commercial buildings and we're using that purchased data. It's a proprietary data set that's meant for primarily real estate brokers. Um, so this is a measured rather than modeled data set. It tends to be better with urban buildings and they miss some of the buildings in the rural areas um, as a result, so just a caveat there. Thanks, Megan. There's a few quite a few more as, as to be expected around sort of digging into the data set, but let's, um, Let's launch our, our second poll at this point, and we'll return back to some questions, but we wanna ask you a question, our audience. Uh, we're interested to learn which uh, data question or questions are top of your mind. So if you could turn your attention to Slido, um, either on your phone or on your internet browser, um, you can select more than one option here, but we're really interested to hear kind of of these kind of different areas, consumption, efficiency, renewables, cost of energy, generation scenarios, commercial buildings. For those of you who are participating in our webinar today, you know, which of these is of greatest interest to you? Kind of which ones are the ones at top of mind? Uh, however you want to frame that, but um, which are the use cases that are, are most relevant uh, to you in your jurisdiction? 
So efficiency, high up there. I sit in the efficiency pillar at DOE, so I'm a little biased. Obviously, we, we think efficiency first uh, and then talk about the value of renewables and, and other things. So that's not a big surprise, but good to see that folks are thinking about energy efficiency potential within their jurisdictions. A little bit of a race here between renewables and costs. Makes sense. Great, this is really helpful feedback. Well, overwhelmingly, majority is efficiency, but we can see that um, quite a few are interested in some of these other um, data questions um, that Slope can help address. So thanks for your feedback. We can, yeah, let's go ahead and close that poll. And I'll turn back to our Q&A here and see um, kind of what else has risen to the top. Okay, so Megan, another one for you. How are delivered fuels handled in slope? Sure, uh, RevStack does include energy efficiency for fuels, which include all fuels. So if we look at the fuel savings potential, we've modeled here fuels including natural gas, propane, bottled gas, um, as well as, well, those are the two main fuels here. <laughs> um, so definitely delivered gas is, um, fuels are included in the red stock modeling for fuel savings. Um, we, we were hoping to include propane and heating, heating oil in this um, modeling, but we didn't have enough finely resolved data to do it well. Um, so this only includes electricity and natural gas that is piped right to your system and a utility. Great, thank you. And the, the, uh, just encouraging you audience, to, we've got a couple more minutes for questions. So uh, continue to either like the ones that uh, are already been entered or type in some new questions. Um, this one on energy burden here is the, the one in, you know, next most popular medium and I know lead is not your area of particular focus. Um, is there anything you think you feel equipped to address here or should we uh, defer this question about energy burden figures and how they're calculated um, offline? Sure, I, I use the lead tool a lot and I'm applying it with cities. Um, it does not, as, as a, if I'm reading this correctly, use the, you know, basically we're just looking at the percentage of your annual income, household annual income spent on utility bills for electricity and natural gas. And so it does not include the, the capital cost of investing in efficiency measures. Um, we're just trying to model out um, how the breakdown in demographics and housing types and housing vintages um, are as far as this energy burden. So we, we do look at electricity, um, in the darker orange here, get natural gas in the lighter orange, and then other would be, um, I think that would be fuel oil as well as people who are using wood stoves, um, pellets, et cetera. So, so that's what the lead tool focuses on. As far as one thing you might want to look at if you're looking at capital costs for efficiency, this, um, Cost of saved energy. What we have here is just the administration cost. It doesn't include the investment cost. But in this report, if you want to really nerd out here, there is um, both costs, yeah. right? So you have we're on, you have we're on your screen at the moment. So if you oh, want okay. to show us something, maybe we can give you control. <laughs> so the, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so in the the report on the program administrator cost of uh, saved energy. That's the last chart that I showed you. If you look in the, um, the de description of the data and you go to that report, there's also data by state on the customer investment costs um, and what those are added up on top of the program administrator costs. A good source for that data. Yeah, and there was a person that was asking specifically about the source for that. I believe it's LBNL in a report that they did a couple of years ago, correct? Correct. 
right, I think we've probably got time for maybe one more question here. Um, one that just popped up, it's a little further down, further down the list, but I think it's a, a good one. Well, let's see if we can hit both of these at the same time. One does, uh, does slope include storage systems for PV and wind? We referenced the battery storage um, part, um, but can you talk about that a little bit more, Megan? Sure, in the levelized cost of energy, there is a battery storage capital cost model, right? That shows the pre precipitous drop in those capital costs for battery storage based on, I believe it's a four hour lithium ion battery um, kind of model. Uh, so capital costs are definitely included in there, as well as um, storage is included in the standard scenarios for generation um, over time. So there's a storage component that their modeling will be incorporated into the grid over time in each state. Um, so that's something to look for as well on storage. Thank you, Megan. So that's all the time we have, unfortunately, to for questions. Thank you for these questions. If you have more slope specific questions, I know we weren't able to get to all of them, but you can certainly feel free to email us at slope at inrel.gov, uh, or you can reach out to any of us that presented today. We're happy to, to answer uh, any further questions and our contact information is provided at the end of the presentation. So thanks, Matt and Megan, uh, again, for your time today, sharing your insights, your experience, um, and really your thoughtful responses to, to a lot of these great questions. Uh, Megan, thanks for uh, addressing many of those. So as we move toward the finish line here, we want to make you aware of some other resources and upcoming events that may be of interest. So I'll leave just yet. Uh, and before we do that, we have two last polls to gather some additional input from you that'll help us ensure that Slope continues to be a valuable platform to you. So we're going to turn to Slido here. Um, I'm keeping our, our folks running the, the webinar on their toes. And you should see, how do you envision using Slope as the next poll question um, that we'd like to get some intel from, from our audience? Got it. Okay, so folks are still not quite sure yet. Obviously, that makes sense. If you're still getting familiar with the, with the platform. Hopefully, after today's presentation, you feel more comfortable with it, and we'll have an opportunity to, to dive in and use it a bit. City energy planning, great. Looks like we've got some states as well as multi-jurisdictional research of interest. Give folks a couple more seconds to fill that out. And then we will hit you with one final poll. Uh, and this next poll will actually uh, try to get your input on some other uh, features and data you'd like to see incorporated in the slope. So this will be a free form option here next. You can go ahead and close that poll and let's launch the last one. So how do you envision using, or so excuse me, what additional features or data would you like to see incorporated on slope in the future? So again, this is an opportunity just to, to write in uh, things that you would be, you know, be helpful to see. I mentioned earlier that we're looking at some scenario planning functionality as well as uh, how we might incorporate environmental justice or equity metrics into slope. I imagine some, of, some or both of those would be very helpful. More granular city level data sets. Yeah, we certainly hear that. We have quite a few, um, but we know that that's an area where there's great interest. End of life housing stock replacement. Okay. Another vote for more city level data. Okay. See, so people are interested in the transportation data that we're going to have coming out and wanting to see more of that. Climate data, demographic data. This is really helpful feedback. Thank you for folks who are offering some input. In a minute here, we're going to talk about some additional resources, but uh, there are going to be some opportunities on March 30th and April 8th to actually go through this uh, uh, on some webinars that we're going to host. So let's go back to the slides, and folks can continue to fill out that poll uh, if they'd like to, um, but I want to highlight a few uh, things for you here quickly because uh, I know we're up against time. So here's some additional resources. I mentioned some webinars. A lot of these resources were referenced uh, during the webinar today. You can go to the next slide. Uh, we're also excited to announce registration for the 2021 Better Buildings, Better Plant Summit. That's open. 
Uh, you can see it's going to be May 17th through the 20th. A lot of engaging interactive sessions, so we encourage you to sign up for that. Next slide. Uh, this is just one part of the 2020-21 uh, webinar series. We've got a lot of great presentations through April, so I encourage you to look out for more of those. Our next webinar on the next slide uh, is actually titled, You Have a Data Center? Now what? So we're going to discuss how you can leverage energy efficiency to streamline operations, cut operating costs, and increase data center resiliency. So I encourage you to join us for that. On uh, the next slide, we are highlighting a new workforce development portal. This is where you can get resources, information, training, education, and job opportunities that can help take the next step towards a career in efficiency. So if uh, that's of interest to you or uh, sharing those resources with those in your jurisdiction, I encourage you to check out that workforce portal. On the next slide, we're going to uh, showcase where you can go back and watch recordings from this webinar once it's posted, uh, other webinars we've done in the past, presentations from our summits. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that for, for uh, more resources, uh, more webinars. And then with that, I'd like to thank our panelists again for taking the time to be with us today. Again, here's our contact information. Um, so feel free to reach out to us with any questions that we could answer today. Um, and you will receive an email notice when the archive of this session is available on the Better Building Solutions Center. Uh, and in the meantime, if you're not already doing so, I encourage you to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on Twitter for all of the latest news. So with that, I'll say thank you to everyone. Have a great rest of your day and week. And we hope to see you in a future webinar. Take care.